Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. It is my great pleasure to welcome best-selling author Richard Bach. He is the author of at least 11 books, starting with Jonathan Livingston Siegel, A Gift of Wings, The Bridge Across Forever, Illusions, The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah, There's No Such Place as Far Away, One, Running from Safety, An Adventure of the Spirit, and in 2009, Hypnotizing Maria, he has a series of books called The Ferret Chronicles and Flying the Aviation Trilogy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome a legend in his own right, Richard Bach, to its rainmaking time. Good morning. Wow, <laughs> what an introduction, Kim. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you. It's all true. It's all true. <laughs> the first question I wanted to ask you was, you know how creative people, particularly, let's say, in music, may come out with an original bestseller for a song. Yep. Yep. And sometimes that bestseller is kind of like being cast in a television show as the main character, and then everybody knows you as that character, rather than for who you are in your full body of work. Yeah. When Jonathan Livingston Siegel was released, was it hard for the public to receive your next book and your next book and your next book from your point of view? Um. No, um, because I, I don't know really what the public is. Uh, there was a lot of attention, a lot of publicity surrounding Seagull uh, a year or so after it was published, uh, and that was a pressure to think, uh, oh, what's my next book going to be? And, and when I realized that, I said, I, I'm not, I don't want to play this game at all. I don't have to write any other books if I don't want to. And the uh, the next book was something that was I thought was uh, much different, and I didn't know whether people were going to much care for it or not. And the same is true today. Uh, I've written a number of books that have been on the bestseller list. I've written a number of books that nobody's ever heard of, except thanks to you this morning. You mentioned the Ferret Chronicles, a series of five wonderful books about um, what 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 could our lives be like. If we gave up the idea of evil, but nobody <laughs> has read those books, well, um, I have, and a close friend has. <laughs> <laughs> so so it goes, whether a book is successful is determined as you type the last page. If the entire set of ideas come running and hug each other on the last sentence and everything that's gone before suddenly makes sense, that's a successful book. Now, whether it ever gets published or not is a completely different story. And that's up to somebody else. That's up to a publisher to decide. It's up to readers to decide if it's going to be well-read or, or not, if it's going to last for 40 years or disappear. I was speaking with Gavin Menzies, who wrote the book 1421. And one of the things he shared is that when 1421 first came out, it didn't do that great. But five or six years later, it took off. Uh -huh. And it almost goes to show you that books have a life of their own, their creative works have a life of their own, and also the public readiness sometimes has a life of its own. Exactly right. Uh, timing is really important, but the, the writer doesn't have anything to do with the timing. The idea will present itself to the writer and say, here I am, are you interested? And sure enough, if that uh, suggestion takes fire, then the book is written. And timing, that's up to, again, that's up to someone else to decide. We can only do our best as, as writers to, to clearly sing whatever idea it is that that inner voice is given to us. Uh, after that, our job's done, and it's up to other forces in the universe to either say, uh, uh, well, that was very nice, but no one happens to be interested in your idea, or uh, you have a worldwide bestseller. When Jonathan first came out, didn't you get some profound rejections? <laughs> You're so sweet. You put it so gently. Yes. Oh, yes. Before before Jonathan was sold, I've got um, I got eighteen uh, reje I got eighteen rejection slips. My agent got a mercifully he didn't tell me how many more. But one of I got was a standard rejection slip. But the editor wrote at the bottom, "Oh." Dear no, and she underlined the dear with an exclamation point. 
Um, <laughs> and that, that's the kind of thing where it, it really teaches you perspective. That's one person's opinion. Sorry to interrupt you, but isn't it amazing how in the author context, you can get caught in a web when your book is being sent out by your agent that it's going to be as good as the consciousness of the people in imagination who are reading it. Exactly right. That's a, that's a wonderful point. Uh, it's just as if, it's the same thing as a review. When you read a review of a book, it's really not about the book. A review is about the reviewer and the reviewer's experience with those ideas that the book represents. If they have been negative, it will be a negative review. And, and then the next reviewer may say, this is the best book I've ever read. And the same thing is true as the poor book goes out to publishers. It depends on who it is that reads the book when it comes in, reads the manuscript when it comes in. I haven't read all of your books, but I will tell you that Jonathan should be in all schools, should be read by all teachers, should be read by all families, and should be given to all children. Listen to that. That is so sweet. It's there true. There are the people who say that Jonathan should be burned and it's ashes stirred in acid. I'm stunned. <laughs> it just I still it. cry when I read that book. Oh, you I still hard. cry when I read that book. It is so profound. And really, it should be required reading for inspiration. Oh, no, it shouldn't be required because it will set some people off. On the imagination level, when it comes to stretching, when it comes to vision, when it comes to dealing with peer pressure, I think it's a beautiful piece. It has a lot to say for certain readers and other readers, and uh, you, can, you can read the reviews on Amazon and, and other places, other readers say, I don't see what anybody sees in this book. And, uh, and that's all right. Yeah. A book is written for a certain family of readers who share certain values. Um, I don't think a book's been written that has, has met the expectations of every single reader. So you get used to that as a writer. You don't say, I'm writing this book for the world. You say, I'm writing this book as an offer to my family, wherever they are out there in the world, and uh, I hope they find it. That's a great perspective. Well, it takes a lot of stress off as a writer, that, that's for sure. Uh, you, you know that uh, the destiny of your book is really not in your... It's in your hands so, so long as you are writing it down. After that, when you've made it as good as you can possibly make it as a writer, when you, as you said, there, there's a part in Jonathan where I still cry when I read that part. And, and when I was doing a, uh, uh, a voice uh, re recording of the thing, I had to go over it about five times before I could read it through without my voice breaking at that particular part. Um, because that, I'm, <laughs> I'm one of those families of readers who really loves that book. Uh, and it's okay for others not to like it. I, I have a gift to give to a certain number of people, and they'll find the book no matter what. Were you concerned when you began formally writing, and I think you had one of the quotes that a professional writer is an amateur that has, what is it? That didn't quit. It yeah. didn't quit. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is so true. You, you look, at the, look at the biography of, of almost any writer, uh, who became commercially successful, and with very rare exceptions, it's a path of, of you go through this rejection. It's like being an actor. You have to be willing to say, this person rejected me and everything that I stand for, but maybe the next person won't. I think an exception is Truman Capote. I think Truman said he had never gotten a rejection slip. Um, but uh, well, well, he's an absolutely wonderful writer. Uh, most of us have to learn our craft, and we do it. We find quality through quantity, uh, which startled me as a, as a young writer when I heard Ray Bradbury give a talk, and he said, the only way you're going to find quality in your writing is by writing a lot. You do, not, you do not dip your quill in purple ink and write one word a day. He said, write a thousand words a day every day for the rest of your life. And I guarantee that in your first year, if you write, 